I'm Evangelia Craniotti and I'm the director of Obscuro Barroco at the Panorama of the Berlin Alley. Existe mais difícil. Do que entregar-se ao instante. Hi, I'm Hannah Cogden and I'm here with Amanglia Craniotti talking to her about her documentary Obscura Barocco. Hi, Evangelia. Hello. Um, so, you, the film follows Luana um, Muniz, yeah. and I wanted to know a little bit about how you got to know her in the first place and her own story. Yeah. Uh, first, the first thing we have to say is that Luana has passed away, and she's not uh, with us anymore. And uh, for a film that is with her, it's not only it's not about her. That was quite a shock for me. Luana was um, a leader in the community uh, in Rio and in Brazil in general. She, she was part of the second uh, generation of transsexuals that traveled to Europe, that helped pave the way for uh, generations of today, that, um, that made things not easier because the situation is bad. But uh, it's, it's one of those generations that sacrificed, in a way, themselves. And Luana was one of those that uh, arrived until the end to have a, a position, like a public position, speak out for the rights of not only transsexuals, but LGBT community in general, but poor people as well. She had an association of, uh, let me see if I, I say it right, she was the president of, uh, of course, uh, uh, transvestite, transsexual, sexual workers of uh, Rio de Janeiro Center. And through this association, she would help people in the streets, she would help children. So she was very active. And her loss is felt to a point that the, the small uh, platz, Brass, mm. in front of her house, uh, was named after her. Now, in, in at least not the municipality, but uh, Uber and Google Maps yeah. have a repert in the repertoire. The place is called the Praça Luana Muniz. So it's like it's a tribute uh, that happened too soon, but yeah. it, it shows something. So Luana, when I was in Rio, I I was um, working on an art project that finally became the film. And uh, in the first version, it was much more fragmented. Uh, it was many short films, some, some of which required to be uh, filmed in the night with transvestites. It was my concept, it was about transformation. Finally, transformation became the heart of the whole project. But at that time, it was just one point. And uh, as Luana was um, in responsible, I'd say, uh, responsible mm -hmm. for uh, the night, like a boss, uh, in, in, in the more anodyne uh, concept of a boss, uh, but uh, still she was someone that had a house there and she would uh, um, have transvestites living in, in that house. And if I wanted to film anyone, I would have to ask her. So I went to ask her permission to film in the center, around her corner in the area, which is a very central place in, in Lap. And I knew she was a public figure. Mm. I had seen her already. And I didn't expect that she would want to work on something like, you know, that artistic, that experimental, that uh, abstract. And we had very, very strong human con connection. And she said yes, and she kind of, you know, pushed it further. She said, we'd do something together. It was much more than I would have asked. And that's how it started. And little by little, uh, we started doing 
experiences that went beyond her usual way of uh, representation because she was known for an, being an activist and she had uh, her way of, of looking at the camera, you know, and, and speaking out loud about what's not working, what's not going on and uh, what should be fixed. And, and also she had a discourse very pronounced about prostitution that in the film I chose to neglect, to put aside because I thought it was another label stuck on the transgender community that needn't, didn't have its place in the film, like Obscuro Barocco, the way that it started to, you know, to, to shape up. That was more a film of magical realism about the vertigo of transformation than about you know, concrete uh, issues of society. Mm. Finally, society is part of the film, it's very important. But with Luana, we went to, um, to conduct experiments that uh, involved also the use of a, of a very, very beautiful text by Clarice, Clarice Lispector, which is a Brazilian author, that Luana uh, uh, tells. Yeah, she's reading the text when it's off. And, then, and that led to, uh, to very, very beautiful situations. So um, it started as a simple permission and it became um, a legacy of the last year of her life. Yeah, so it now feels almost like a tribute to her. Yeah, yes. The mm. film now is, uh, is dedicated to her and how couldn't it be? And uh, the film being in panorama, very LGBT-oriented and edgy selection, it's, it's very legitimate, it makes sense. What doesn't make sense is her death, but does it ever make sense? Mm -hmm. And in the way uh, Luana saw things, it was all about being uh, born again somewhere else. It was about renaissance, it was about transformation. So she just chose to transform earlier. She had said what she had to say. It's, it was weird because she died really after the, the end of the, the shootings in Rio. So sort of another transformation for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the film is told in this sort of dreamlike, ethereal style. And I thought that there was quite a big contrast between that sort of dreamlike fantasy um, and then the quite harsh reality that lies beneath it that for trans people actually um, they're the victim of a huge amount of violence and there's been an incredibly high number of LGBT deaths um, in Brazil over recent years. Can you explain that decision to present um, this particular story with that sort of dreamlike quality? Well, uh, it was First, I could not, not have done it that way because it's my way of filming and my way of looking at posing my, my gaze upon reality. Then Latin America being home to magical realism and Rio being the city that, like Tropical Malady, made me want to film. I started filming there. This is why I wanted to pay this tribute to this very cinematographic uh, city. It asked for me to be filmed that way. I, 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 it's how I felt. And then the contrast between the ever going on transformation and yet this social, um, this reality, harsh reality, violence, and reality that doesn't make sense, that rejects, keeps on rejecting people that push transformation to the limits of the body, to the limits of identity, in a place that keeps on transforming every year for Carnival, you know, that is much more familiar to the concept of transformation than any other country in the world, I guess. That felt uh, ironic um, and f made, yeah, gave me the, the urge to say beyond the beauty of images, beyond the, um, the, the sensuality of nature, this, this wild thing, um, I must find ways, you know, to show the edges of these things, the ways that could uh, make you think, like, it's not only transvestites, for instance, there is this moment in the film where you see children dancing on very sexual music. Mm. Um, it, it is about otherness. It's a film about otherness, starting from the fact that I am other 
because I'm Greek and I make a film about Brazil, it's another culture. And um, it starts with another duality, another sort of contrast between uh, two elements of tragedy um, as defined in the birth of tragedy by Nietzsche, uh, the Apollonian and the Dionysiac. So Rio was for me the Dionysiac element with all its violence and all its uh, <coughs> uh, you know, this feeling of being drunk, this very vigorous electric vibe. So showing the, um, the harshness was also conscious because that was the year of the Olympic Games and it was the year when everyone would show um, how to Rio, you know, guides to Rio, car postal, things to Rio. And I filmed that night, I all basically mostly filmed at night. I was looking for shining of lights in the dark um, and a more dirty Rio, the way I had experienced it. So I felt it felt more close to the truth. My truth, the truth of Luana and of what I was seizing from the city. So it's Yes, it's, it's very conscious. Yeah, and maybe captures the paradox of the fact that Brazil is a country with like the biggest gay pride parade and yet the and highest, the level, highest of level of violence and killings and rapes and of and the highest rate of uh, of um, use of pornographic material translated. Uh, it's, it is uh, this uh, contradiction, this uh, irony. The fact that uh, <coughs> it's this thing that doesn't seem right somehow. So I wanted to make a film about that as well, but not a very social film. This is why um, using as a scenery this city, a, a situations like Carnival, uh, besides that showing of the obvious how come, you know, how come you play with this ephemeral identity change mm. and how come these people still try to find a space uh, but it gives this, this dream-like quality that for me is much, very much linked to the experience of living there. Mm. So I had to, to combine these two um, extremes. Mm. And th there's also a lot of kind of biblical imagery. Um, so we talk about like the Edenic city and apocalyptic orgasm and all these kinds of phrases. What were you trying to do with that imagery? This is Luana's uh, concept of the city. Mm. She calls the city, it has to do with cycles of transformation because herself, she lived and died and was born again there. Um, symbolically speaking, because she, she, she passed through much in her life and um, we can say she died again. So she was calling me Rio, Eden and Inferno and Purgatorio. Brazilian culture being a very Catholic culture, um, I think that it, um, it added to the spiritual of the film that starts with a ritual, a uh, um, syncretic religious ritual of Preto Velho, which is an Umbanda ritual. And um, I thought it was really emblematic, the way she, she was looking at the city and she was calling her these names. And I th also think that she thought that she stuck somewhere in between Edem and, and Inferno. She was, um, I think she was at the Purgatorio, actually. And, um, and the, the text of Clarice Lispector gave me the chance to make an echo to that. As you say, the Apocalypse Orgasmico. <coughs> Um, and there's one phrase before the carnival, well, Luana says it, but it's Halley's inspector saying, us before the scandal of death. It says all this excess is a way to deal with the death of the city, the end of life, the end of things. Um, so yes, it's, it's telescopage, it's echoes of, of that, of being transformed in many ways, mm. being consumed in many ways. And talking about that transformation, the transformation of the body is obviously such a central transformation that's taking place. Um, there's a lot of discussions of um, surgery towards, um, on the body and how the body can be changed in that way, but also um, just 
growing older and how the body changes as you grow older, were you trying to make a suggestion that actually the desire to um, have surgery done on your body is can be just as natural as the changes yes. that happen to the body as you grow older? Yes, because the film, um, through the editing process, uh, we wanted to confront situations where um, simple uh, everyday citizens uh, will feel close and uh, concerned by issues that the first uh, uh, you know, apprehension doesn't concern, don't concern them. So aging, growing old, is a transformation that everyone undergoes. And um, in another way, uh, there is transformation of the identity and of the sex, of the gender. And in the end of the film, we see protests about the transformation of the social body, not the intimate body. Resistance to transformations, which at the time, and still is, was the impeachment of Dilma, was uh, this it's like a, a rape that happened to the, the political body. Many people felt it like that, and um, it, it was something like that. And um, by chance, by, by my, not good chance, but um, that period, a girl in a favela, she was raped by 30 men, and uh, it was filmed and put online. It was considered a, very, a big scandal, it was a big issue, and many manifestations took place, initiated by women, about that. It was a chance for many women to step out and tell their stories, sometimes transsexuals as well, to tell, because it's not only women, but the big, and also men. Mm. And um, putting the, the, the protest of the, in the end, where the carnival block or uh, kind of a groups of the street transform into a manifestation, mm. was a way of say, saying that all these are democratic demands. Um, of resisting to any anthropological fatum. I mean, no destinies. It's, it's better to have doubts. It's better to have desires and not seeing ourselves being imposed um, mm. politics or agendas. So what you say is the very first and very basic is that we all undergo and change. And that's the, the slowly going change, the process of time. Um, we don't all, always, not all of us choose the more violent curve of changing identity or changing gender, but as the film says at some point, who am I at this instant? I personally believe that we change every 30 minutes or something, that we, the mood change, the, the desires change, and it goes like with that flow of ever roller coasting on, on your decisions and desires. So, yeah, I wanted with this film to not show it like that, but insinuate it, suggest that, you know, we all look alike on that. It's the same concern, mm. but you focus elsewhere and someone else focuses elsewhere. And it's so much vertiginous, the gender issue, that it requires more respect and more space mm. to talk about it more, to think about it too. Um, envisager, like to consider it. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much for talking to Thank us. Thank you today. very much. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Me.